and, and discussion at the end. Um, and there's going to be lots of info, uh, but we will be recapping throughout the way. And yes, there will be um, uh, resources and, 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 and info that we'll get to you at the end. We're going to find a way to get this online. Um, so so um, rest assured that, that you won't lose out on, on anything. Um, so a lot of, you know, I, I feel like it's important to just start off with a very quick primer about what private equity is because um, it's this sort of opaque thing that uh, um, a lot of people sort of have heard about it but don't, don't, don't know um, too much about what it is. Uh, and um, it's really important because it's incredibly powerful and uh, for many colleges and universities, it's, you know, private equity and sort of its, its cousins are where they allocate you know most uh, or uh, you know a lot of their of their investments. Um, this is a uh, uh, this is a graph from a couple of years ago that shows um, the the wh where Harvard, Stanford, and Yale allocated their endowments. But this could also apply to to many other schools. So you know there's all kinds of ways universities invest in fossil fuels, but private equity is a major one. So so what is private equity? Um, most most um, simply, it's just money that's invested in private private companies. But really, um, it, we have to get a bit, bigger picture of it to to get its significance. Um, so, what private equity firms do is they create funds, and wealthy people and institutional investors, like pension funds and endowments, um, commit money, invest money in these funds. And you have to be have a lot of money to invest in these funds. There's usually a minimum investment that's that's a lot of money. And then what these, the, these, these private equity firms do with these funds is invest these quite aggressively usually into private companies, not always private companies, but typically private companies, with the aim of getting quick and big returns for themselves and for the investors, often even if it destroys the companies. So for instance, they might you know, buy Toys R Us and load it up with debt and fire a bunch of workers, do all these things to, to transfer money to themselves and then leave the, 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 the company hanging out to dry. Um, that's the sort of uh, um, part of the private equity model. Um, they also charge very high fees and this makes their executives some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world. And uh, we'll look at a few examples of that. Um, and, uh, also private equity, you know, it invests in pretty much everything but it invests widely in fossil fuel companies. And um, it's, this is really important because private equity has put tens of billions of dollars into fossil fuel op operations, particularly the fracking industry, you know, over the past you know, five to 10 years um, in risky operations that have like really driven drilling and fracking um, that you know, might not otherwise have happened because lenders might have not wanted to, to lend to these risky, some of these risky, riskier ventures. Um, private equity executives are extremely powerful people. Um, as you'll see, they, they sit on all kinds of prestigious boards. They have buildings named after them at major campuses. Um, they're big donors and so on. This is a Bloomberg cover uh, from uh, about a half a year ago or so that says you live in private equities world. And, um, it's, a lot of it's online. I'd recommend taking a look at it if, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, in learning more about private equity. Um, and you know, finally, uh, pri like a lot of different movements and campaigns have a common foe in private equity because you might have a firm that is invest that is in is is a, is a landlord and is also on the other side of a fight that workers are engaged in is also invested in a um, a, a power plant that a community is opposed to. So through private equity, there's real potential to to um, you know build build coalition. I think. Um, one example of a private equity firm is, uh, is Blackstone Group. It's the biggest private equity firm in the world. Um, as of a few months ago, it was overseeing $571 billion in assets. And to put that in perspective, that is, in terms of GDP, that would make it um, the, the uh, uh, 20 or 21st biggest country in the world in terms of GDP, bigger than Sweden and Nigeria and so on. Its CEO and, and, and um, uh, 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 co-founder, Stephen Schwartzman, is worth about $20 billion. He's incredibly powerful. Um, he was the chair of the now disbanded uh, CEO council that Trump set up when he, when he was elected, which was his basic 
Corporate Advisory Council. Schwartzman is a big donor and a close ally and advisor to Trump. Um, until recently, he was one of the biggest landlords in, in the entire United States because Black, uh, Blackstone bought up a ton of uh, housing stock after the 2008 housing crash and um, became a sort of sketchy landlord. Uh, it's also just, as, uh, as I kind of alluded to before, been the target of a lot of different campaigns around housing, around workers' rights, and so on. And it has billions invested in fossil fuel companies. These are some of the companies that's invested or has been recently invested in. Shenny Air, for example, is the biggest liquefied natural gas um, uh, producer, I believe, in the, in the, in the U.S. And uh, so, yeah, Blackstone is, 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 is involved in all of this. Um, one thing that might be useful as you start to approach this research um, of like digging into university fossil fuel private equity investments is just to kind of get a, a sort of basic understanding of some of the big prop, big private equity managers. Um, this is uh, there's a link here to a great report put out by this organization called Private Equity Stakeholder Project um, that surveys uh, some of these some of the biggest private equity firms um, in the world and their fossil fuel holdings. So you, you know you click and you go to this report and um, uh, it's just this. Uh, uh, let's see here. Oh, there, just needed a second to load. It's just this long report with um, you know, all these different companies that are owned by private equity firms when they were acquired and so on. Useful resource that we'll, we'll make available, that we'll make sure you, you have the link to. But um, there's different types of private equity firms, diversified ones that invest in all types of things. Those are like the true global powerhouses. Um, energy focused private equity firms that um, invest primarily in the fossil fuel industry, but also other energy sectors private infrastructure managers that invest in things like power plants and, 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 and such. So, you know, as, 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 you're, as you get, to get into this world of private equity and do this research, these names will become more um, familiar. And finally, just before we go, this is, this is kind of what I've laid out, but it's an important model to, to remember, which is, you know, you have the private equity firm, the private equity firms um, oversees funds that investors like universities has had the opportunity to um, uh, uh, commit money to. And then these funds invest in different things. And we're, it, it could be anything, but we're looking at, at fossil fuel companies today. Um, one quick sort of thing, uh, database, you know, I'm gonna sort of drop these as we go. One, one database to, to, uh, that, that is useful is called the International, sorry, hold on. Um, my something, my PowerPoint thing is covering this up. So uh, let's see here. Let me try doing it this way. Is there it investment go. advisor public disclosure database? Yeah, yeah. The, pro the, the problem was that like the, uh, whenever I tried to click on it, the, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, um, PowerPoint, th you know, thing that comes up came up. So I couldn't click on it, but we're here. Okay, we got it. So. Um, this is, it's called the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website, and basically any private equity firm or other investment advisors that are advising, you know, uh, endowments or just, you know, pension funds or things like that need to file with, file disclosures with this. So if we put, you know, the name of one of the, the big private equity firms here, Carlisle Group. Um, So uh, click on Carlisle Group, you see different brochures, um, and two are important, the ADV for, uh, filing and uh, this brochure. And basically what these are, um, are brochures that tell you tons of information about like the private equity firm because they have to file all this information about their sort of who they are, their investment strategies, you know, what they do and so on. And there's a lot of information in here about their you know, their energy investments. Um, and we're, we'll come back to Carlisle Group a little later. Um, here's an ADV form that Carlisle had to fill out. And what this lists in it is a lot of its different funds. So, you know, we won't go through it right now, but if you were to go through this, you'd see, you know, there's a lot of different names of its funds. So this is one way to ID um, funds of private equity firms. Um, so what we're going to do basically for the rest of this is just proceed through two different case studies 
of how to dig into these private equity firms and their fossil fuel holdings and their, their connections to, to um, uh, uh, university endowments. And so rather than sort of you know, dryly list everything, we're gonna try to tell two stories how about how, how you can research this stuff. Um, and the first one's a little more straightforward. The second one is a little more, um, uh, uh, a little more complicated, but. So um, how private equity tied or ties the University of Michigan to a toxic oil billionaire. It's not just the University of Michigan, but we will, we will focus on them for reasons that we'll see. Um, so late last year, I was doing a report on looking at this group called Empower Texans, which is this hard right uh, group backed by oil billionaires in Texas that um, has really been bankrolling, you know, ultra conservative causes like, um, uh, uh, like you know, legislation against transgender rights, um, uh, like against gay uh, um, uh, marriage equality, um, uh, you know, attacking voting rights, and so on. And I was researching them, and the main oil billionaire who funds them is a guy named Tim Dunn. So um, in the process of looking you know, at Tim Dunn, he makes his money from this company called CrownQuest. CrownQuest is one of the biggest um, oil drillers in Texas. It's, it's in the top 30. And that makes it, of course, one of the biggest oil drillers in the United States. And if you go to their website and you look at their operations, I won't read this all, but basically it says Crown, CrownQuest um, and this, it does all the field operations for this company called Crown Rock. Crown Quest, in effect, is Crown Rock. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Let's Google Crown Rock, right? And when you do that, um, you know, the first thing that comes up is uh, you see that Crown Rock is um, a portfolio company of Lime Rock Partners. Lime Rock Partners is exactly one of those energy private equity funds. So, um, you know that's interesting, right? So, so let's let's you know learn a little bit more about Crown Rock and Lime Rock Partners is is the next thing in the research process that we're thinking. So, you know, there's a lot of different searching and googling that we do, but let's try one search tactic that is really useful for researching this type of stuff. It's doing site searches around the business and financial press, Bloomberg.com, um, pensions and investments, um, Barrons, you know, sites like that. So. Um, here is a site search that we do around um, with, with Crown Rock, right? Now, if you don't know what site search is, there's one of the things you learned is there's sort of tricks you can use with Google um, and where you put um, words like site and then you put the name of the, the, the website that you want to look at and then you put search terms after that and what the results that you'll get are any anything with the search terms that comes up in the website that you're doing the site search around, right? So there we go. Now, the first thing that comes up, Lime Rock raises 1.9 billion fund to retain Crown Rock. Um, now, I'm probably not gonna be able to read this right now because I might've run out of my Bloomberg. Oh, there, it does come up, um, oh, maybe not. Um, but if we were to be able to read this, uh, I've, I'm out of my free Bloomberg articles right now, unfortunately. But um, if we were to read this, what we would see, let me get out of this is that um, in the article it says uh, there's this, um, that, that Lime Rock finances Crown Rock through a fund called Lime Rock Partners 4AF. So basically this is one of those private equity funds that is financing Tim Dunn's business operations. So um, the next step, you know, naturally was, okay, so, you know, let's learn more about Lime Rock Partners 4AF. Um, and what I, what it, the types of things that I started doing there were, again, some of these um, different combinations of keywords, Lime Rock Partners for AF, um, you know, investors, private, equ uh, uh, private equity universities, things like that. Um, also, in addition to site searches around business press, file type searches. So you can do file type PDF, for instance, is a helpful one because port, you know, portfolios are often published in PDF form. So let's look at an example of that. Um, oh, sorry. So there's stories about this now because this has since become public, but um, uh, what, what you would see is if you did a, you do a PDF search, uh, or sorry, I did one with endowment. Um, let me try this again. Okay, there's a file type PDF search. The first thing you see is that um, 
let me click some of these, is that, uh, you know, here's this PDF, Regents, received by the Regents of the University of Michigan, October 18th, 2018. And this basically it talks about the different energy private equity funds that the University of Michigan is investing in. And one of them, of course, is Lime Rock Partner for AF, um, $26 million. Uh, so basically now we're really on to something because we're seeing that the University of Michigan is not only investing in this, um, you know, this, this fund that's financing one of the top oil drillers in Texas, but it's also uh, the, bit, the, the fund that's, you know, feeding the fortune of Tim Dunn. So um, in, in, this, in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna do all these other searches, but these were other types of searches that, that, that I did. You know, private, this is private, or sorry, pensions and investments online.com, did that with Lime Rock Partners. These are type, the types of things that come, came up, again, about the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, you know, you start, you're able to start putting the puzzle together. So, um, of course, the, the question then is like, you know, we did some of these Googling, what are sort of maybe more advanced databases that we can use to see who else is invest in Lime Rock Partners for AF? Um, there's different databases that you can use. The one that I'm gonna focus on right now, we'll come back to some of the other ones later, is one called Citizen Audit. Um, Citizen Audit is, uh, um, you can, it's, it's something that you can use for, for free for a few times. It is subscription based. Um, it's possible you could get a subscription or have a subscription through your university. If you're connected to like a national you know, climate or climate justice group, you might, they, they might or might be able to have access to it. It's not super expensive. It's a few hundred dollars. You could also reach out to, you know, other, other allies, hint, hint. Um, but uh, uh, um, basically, you know, what you do is, you know, you go here, you can put um, lime rock partners four will do, right? And um, it reveals um, tax documents, form 990s. And, um, or actually, let me do Lime Rock Partners four. Eight. Okay, here, yeah, you're starting to see that, you know, there's a bunch of of universities that are invested in Lime Rock Partners, um, the Lime Rock Partners Fund, right? Now, some of these might be from a couple of years ago. Some of these might be more recent. Uh, but, um, you know, the point is this is a research tool where you can actually, you know, just tr play around with Googling the name of a fund and find out other investors. One caveat here that I'll say is that um, Lime Rock Partners, uh, the, the Lime Rock Partners for AF grew out of a previous fund, Lime Rock Partners for LP. The Bloomberg article that I mentioned before said that almost all the funds that were in the previous fund that ended in 2018 spilled over into the new fund, Lime Rock Partners for AF. A lot of those, you know, that we that, that if you were to click on those, you'd see a lot of those are from you know um, the previous fund, but it's very likely that they're invested in the new fund based on the information we know. It's just not able to confirm it yet because sometimes, you know, this information takes a little bit, little bit of time to come out and that new, new Lime Rock fund um, only closed in 2018. But it, you can start putting the puzzle together a little bit. So now the next thing, of course, is like, let's sort of try to power map this all, all out visually. Um, and here, you know, you can really see, you know, what this looks like when you start to power map it out. I didn't mention, but University of or Michigan State is also invested in Lime Rock Partners for AF. Um, and you can really tie together, you know, how University of Michigan, these private equity firms and drilling operations and Tim Dunn and Empower Texans are all part of the same story. Um, Incidentally, a lot of these resources are also available in a toolkit that we put together on power research and power mapping that um, is, a, is listed as a resource at the end. And, um, you know, uh, we also run regular, regular trainings on how to use um, the little sys oligrapher. Uh, let me see. So that basically, um, you know, you could all do this yourself, you know, form these maps, you know, don't just, you know, we can, for instance, put, you know, Donald Trump, right? And then Mike Pence, and, you know, you can learn how to do this in five minutes. You know, you can add, um, 
add things like you know person x and you know say that they have their front you know a donor to trump but anyways so th these are all things that you can you can do um you know that you, you that you you, all, you, you, can, you can have access to and we'll have links to, to all of these things at the end um so uh what I'm going to do now, though, is, is hand it over to um, Noah from the University of Michigan Climate Action Movement, who's going to talk for a second about like how they were able to to use information like this, because I think this is this is like the biggest biggest piece of the puzzle, right? Like through doing this research and power mapping, what can you do with it? So, um, Noah, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. Uh, yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Noah. Um, been working with Cam climate action movement at Michigan for the last couple of years, pretty much since it started. Also uh, organized with a group called Science for the People. Um, and just to give a little background, uh, we've been working on divestment just as sort of one piece of a larger campaign of, you know, a just transition to uh, what we call true carbon neutrality, since it seems kind of obvious and yet nobody really talks about it. But if you have partial ownership of some entity, you also have sort of partial ownership of those emissions. Um, so true carbon neutrality obviously uh, necessitates divestment. Um, so our, uh, you know, one thing we identified early on is that um, there really was very little awareness of the extent of the University of Michigan's investments in fossil fuels. Not only just that, but it's climate action in general. Universities are pretty good at PR. Um, and so, we engage in a pretty sustained campaign of just building awareness, um, lots of flyering and public sort of comments and uh, op-eds and such, just to make sure people were aware of the reality of the situation, which was that the University of Michigan has over a billion dollars invested in fossil fuel, the vast, and that's just private equity. There's another about 300 million in, in public stocks, we estimate. So um, we were coming at it from the university end, um, which we found mostly through the university's own reports of investments. We didn't have itemized investments, but um, you could tell they had a few broad categories and from their own descriptions, the natural resources category was almost purely oil and gas companies. And so that was enough to be able to go at the sort of claim a, a billion dollars in, um, in fossil fuels, um, just quoting them. But then also we were able to corroborate that through some of these, um, as Derek showed, some of these meeting minutes from the regents where they approve some of these individual investments. And so finding out where they made those individual approvals and then going through old meeting minutes and pulling out the numbers and verifying that, yes, over the last few years, this would add up to a certain amount. And we were able to find the Lime Rock, but we had no idea. You know, we stopped at that point. We didn't know that Lime Rock was also, uh, you know, you could follow that graph to these pretty um, heinous uh, other actions of the, you know, this uh, PAC um, and Empower Texans. So um, as we were working on uh, basically uh, the university's response to our divestment advocacy, as many of you may uh, be familiar with uh, in your own campaigns, is basically that the endowment is not political and that divestment is symbolic. Um, those were two very common ones. And uh, if you're able to switch slides, Derek, the, um, uh, that's where the, this connection, when Derek reached out to us um, with the connection between the University of Michigan and Empower Texans became very useful because it basically makes, uh, it really crystallizes the message, right? It, these sort of abstract investments um, end up having very real consequences, which is what this story shows, right? You have, uh, you know, this group basically fighting for these bathroom bills and um, suppressing voter rights, uh, et cetera. And uh, those have very real impacts that people are sort of familiar with. Um, and the, it ties the university to those impacts. Uh, it also links more clearly, right, like the climate, uh, fight for climate justice and how it's intertwined with these, uh, you know, other fights for justice, right? That they're not separate, uh, which is a story I think most of us know, but also is not <laughs> frustratingly quite mainstream yet. Um, and so it helps to 
um, further that conversation. It helped also very clearly refute the administration's claim that the endowment is apolitical. Here is almost comically so, right? Um, and uh, uh, furthermore, it came to us right at a point when we were partnering with another organization on um, at the University of Michigan, uh, the One University campaign, which was is uh, still fighting for um, more equitable um, treatment of three different campuses of the University of Michigan. So Ann Arbor is sort of the main campus that most people know about, but there's actually three campuses, um, and two of them are sort of the under the stairs campuses that get the scraps of resources. And so um, they've been fighting hard to um, make that uh, resource allocation much more equitable, um, especially given that it tends to, uh, it also correlates with the fact that those campuses um, serve communities that also have historically been under-resourced. Um, and so we were teaming up with them and it made that message very clear as well in terms of where the university is prioritizing its investments um, and choosing to invest in fossil fuels and indeed in far-right uh, political campaigns as opposed to uh, its own campuses and underserved campuses. And so uh, really those helping to make that clear connection and the message is really where that type of, um, where the Lime Rock um, connection helped us in our campaign. We actually managed to get a freeze on uh, new fossil fuel investments just a couple months after, um, after, after getting that connection. And so, and this was a good part of the the messaging that we had with the regions in in pushing for this. So, that's all I got. Great. Thanks so much, Noah. Um, and I, I think that's you know one of the things that's really important here is is um, when, you, when you're doing power, this type of power research and power mapping, you know, sometimes it's really about just finding like one, one you know, a, a couple of things through this mapping where you say, you know, oh, we can point out conflicts of interest or hypocrisy, things that we can find leverage around um, that are sort of doorways into, into um, or strategic doorways in, uh, for, for, for campaigns that you all were able to, to use so, so, so uh, successfully and, 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 and uh, and so well. Um, just to do a quick recap, uh, I have to move a move along because um, um, we're about a half an hour in now. So the, I, the, I think the main takeaways from this are, of course, sort of like obsessive and targeted googling, which is probably, you know, not news to anyone. But um, you know, there's also specific, you know, combinations of words and specific types of like, you know, site searches and um, format uh, file type searches <laughs> that you can use. Um, to to um, uh, uh, you know find information, um, yeah, and um, and of course you know sometimes just like old fashioned combinations like this work. You know if you, if you open this up, it shows you a bunch of different private equity fund firms that um, uh, University of Washington is 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 invested in, and, and a, a few a few of them are are private equity energy firms. Um, uh, and so, yeah, you know, looking at the business press, you know, using some of these um, databases. And I think also the most important thing is really, you know, um, if you find anything, you won't always find stuff. Um, it's, it might not happen right away. It might take a long time. It might be even, you know, uh, uh, really frustrating. Um, you know, sometimes I've searched for things for days before I <laughs> hit upon something, not literal days, but, you know, on and off. Um, and, uh, 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 so I think it's important to just be kind of patient and just to keep, you know, uh, uh, searching and, and following things. Um, so we're going to move on to our second story now. And the second story is called Natural Gas Partners. It's a big hit with universities. So um, uh, one day, uh, a couple months ago, I saw in the news that the, the divestment campaign from the U University of Pittsburgh was um, doing some big actions. And so I went to look at their um, 990 forms. Now, if you're not familiar with the 990 form, um, these are really, really important things to um, know about. They're basically IRS forms that nonprofits, um, such as like universities, um, need to complete to provide financial information to the public. And in particular, there's something called the 990T that's part of the 990 filing, where universities have to report, quote, unrelated business income. 
And when universities invest in private equity firms, they do it through a business vehicle called a, a limited partnership. Um, and so basically, uh, they have to report like any, um, you know, um, income or losses through these um, to, to, to the IRS. And they don't need to always necessarily be super transparent about it, but sometimes they're more transparent than, than others. Um, let me go back to this real quick. So um, if you go to, you know, the ProPublica database, I'll do this one time because I'm not, I'm not going to be able to keep doing it just because um, for time reasons, but um, here, let me get rid of some of these things. So it'll go up here. All right. Um, and you put in university. Um, and you click on University of Pittsburgh. Uh, okay. And um, you go to their most recent, nine, most recent 990 filing and let's look at their 990T. If you went to their 990, it would just have you know, a bunch of information. Sometimes these investments are in the 990, but usually they're in the 990T, so it helps to look at both. So this was filed, this covers until the end of, of middle of, of, uh, of 2018. Now, if you go to the end, um, it says partnership one, partnership two, partnership three. Now this is frustrating because sometimes you know they're allowed to do this. They can just put generic terms, partnerships. These are all private equity funds that they're invested in, but they don't they don't name them. But you know, I went a year earlier to 2017, which presumably a lot of the ones that we just saw, those partnerships are um, are um, you know continued, right? Um, and here they have the actual names, and you can see that. You know, there's a lot of energy ones, um, not super surprising since Pittsburgh's in the middle of fracking country, but um, uh, there's a few in particular called natural gas partners. And there's a few, um, and uh, so, you know, that interested me because I had seen, you know, natural gas partners before. It's a pretty powerful, big um, um, private equity energy firm. Um, just to take a quick detour though, um, before we get back to natural gas partners, just to reiterate that looking at these 990Ts is really important. So for example, these are the most recent 990Ts of University of Illinois, University of Nebraska, and you see in, in, in they have, you know, just tons of fossil fuel investments, right? Um, uh, uh, so, you know, you're not always going to find information for your college or university. In fact, in a lot of cases you won't, but um, you sometimes will. A lot of them do file th this information. And um, uh, so, you know, it's a really sort of important research tactic. So, you know, seeing this, like I was just kind of Googling, uh, continuing to look around and really just by total chance, I looked up, I was looking at sort of liberal arts institutions and I looked up Carleton College uh, in Minnesota and, um, you know, their most recent um, 990T form showed that they were also in, uh, um, invested in natural gas partners funds. And also you can see their most recent audit and it gives you a sense of, you know, private equity and hedge funds, hedge funds, we won't get into it, but they're somewhat similar to private equity. Um, how, how they really sort of dominate the, um, you know, the investments of the, of the college. So, you know, at this point, you know, it's interesting that you have, you're seeing that, you know, a lot of these colleges and universities are, are investing in this, in these natural gas partners funds. So let's research, like who is natural gas partners anyway, right? Um, so, you know, the first thing you do, of course, is you go to their website. Private equity firms don't always, but usually they have um, parts of their website that show their um, port portfolios, right? So if you go to, you know, Natural Gas Partners and you go to Investments, um, these are all the different active portfolio companies that Lime Rock, or sorry, not Lime Rock, that, um, uh, natural Gas Partners has. These are basically companies that Natural Gas Partner is financing and in partnership with others that are doing like the, the, the field operations, right? And these are mostly, you know, um, drilling companies, pipeline companies in major drilling fields in the U.S. as well as Canada. Um, I also, you know, again, going back to Googling, doing a file type search with Natural Gas Partners. Um, I did a file type PDF search, Natural Gas Partners. It turns up, you know, the first thing that comes up um, is this uh, uh, PDF 
uh, um, that a PowerPoint presentation that someone from Natural Gas Partners did um, that, uh, that you know, surveys private equity, but also tells you a little bit about Natural Gas Partners, how endowments are one of its biggest customers, uh, also the names of its funds. And it also says down here, interestingly, um, that it has a strategic partnership with the Carlisle Group. That I did not know. Um, that's significant because the Carlisle Group is a private equity powerhouse. It's the second or third biggest private equity firm in the world. So that's you know, something interesting to research more. Um, we don't have enough time to click on everything here. So you'll have to take my word for all this and there's links to it. But basically, um, you know, what, what, you know, what I did or what I you know, did with some people that I was collaborating with too was, um, you know, went and looked at uh, natural gas partners, sorry, not NDP, NGPs, um, uh, uh, brochures in that, again, that IAPD um, database that, that we talked about. And it says in there that the Carlisle Group is an indirect owner of the, of the firm, basically. And then, and then I went to look at some of Carlisle, Carlisle Group's filings. For instance, it has an annual re, um, report that it files a, with the SEC because Carlisle, some private equity firms are publicly traded and Carlisle is publicly traded, so it has to file info. This is also in Carlisle's IAPD filing. But Carlisle basically says like it, do, it, 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 it's entitled to 55% of the fees of NGP, and it basically does all its, all its you know, um, North American energy investments through NGP. So it's like, wow, right? Carlisle is, um, you know, a, a big private equity villain in a lot of ways. It, um, it, uh, um, uh, it has been connected to all types of things like, you know, here's some headlines, you know, for example, right? Um, you know, it was an owner of, of, of the land that mo of mobile homes and was, you know, raising rents and kicking people out and took a public meet, public hit because of that. It bought up a nursing home and totally just, you know, basically, just, you know, neglected its patients. It lobbies for tax breaks for, for private, private, um, private equity managers. And if anybody's in or around Philly, you know, private, uh, Carlisle Group's the group that bankrupted the Philadelphia Energy Solutions the big oil refinery there that blew up and, you know, it may be the sort of biggest environmental justice issue um, in, in um, you know, in and around Philadelphia. It, so, you know, what I also started to do after that to sort of draw these connections together more was I did a site search of Carlisle Group and just did NGP, Natural Gas Partners. And some of the things that come up you see are that there's important interlocks, right? These are, this is a Carlisle senior advisor to the Carlisle Group, who's the former um, CEO and co-founder and, and, and co-founder of NGP Energy Capital. He also has a lot of other connections. You know, he was, you know, to to Harvard, to the Texas Rangers, the George Bush Center, so, so on. And here's another one who, again, is um, uh, he has he's a sort of bridge between Carlisle and uh, and um, and uh, uh, Natural Gas Partners. The, but the big honcho in Carlisle Group is David Rubenstein. Um, he is a billionaire who is one of the most influential and powerful people in the United States. Um, he is the, the, I think now the executive chairman um, of, of Carlisle Group, which ba basically means more than anyone else, he runs the show. He's connected to all these major cultural and educational institutions in the United States. He's a huge donor to Harvard, University of Chicago, Duke. I think he has buildings or something named for him after in all those places and has been on you know, leadership positions and so on. So, um, you know, this is all getting particularly interesting because, you know, now we're really developing a, a picture of what this all looks like, um, of what this, you know, power network looks like. Um, so two more steps here and then we'll, 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 we'll call it a day for in terms of my presentation. So the, um, we, you know, wanted to, of course, like find out more details, like who, who what are these natural gas partner, partners funds um, invested in exactly right. So um, one way to find this out is through a this through a database called PitchBook. Now PitchBook again, this is a subscriber database, um, so you need to have a subscription to it. Uh, one thing I'll say is that if you are at a university, um, a lot of universities have subscriptions to it, particularly through the business school, and um, you can probably get access to it through that. You, you talk to a librarian. Um, uh, 
And also, you know, if you don't have access to that, again, you know, there might be national movement organizations or allies and that you can like reach out to, um, to, to look up a private equity fund, for instance, right? So I'm gonna look up natural gas partners here and I'm gonna go to all funds, right? And, um, you know, um, natural gas partners 10 and 11 are the funds that I was finding the most in, in the 990 forms, right? So let's click on natural gas partners 11 here. Uh, we don't want to save information. So this is the pitch book page for the, the fund. And um, basically, you know, what you see if you go down is um, you know, investors in the fund, including some universities, uh, and also fund investments. So these are different companies that um, is invested. Now, you, if you see a company, you always have to follow it up, Google it, because sometimes it's not up to date, but it's a useful re, um, re, re, uh, research resource. Another thing you can do is just Google the name of the fund and search terms like about us or operations, because what the portfolio companies um, usually have information about you know being um, tied to the fund, or they put out news news briefs, right? So, for example, by googling that, doing doing that, um, you see come to this Black Mountain Oil announces partnership with Natural Gas Partners, and, and below it says it's you know being funded by that specific fund. So you know through these types of like search um, you know search terms, you're also able to find out information like this. So finally, um, the and I, I, I um, sorry I'm running through this. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer some at the end, and also um, you know uh, uh, over email or what have you. But um, so that we're coming to the end now, and so sort of basically through doing using citizen audit again and doing 990 searches and so on, um, I was able to compile a list, probably partial, because um, I'm sure there's many more. Of, but this is just where you know where I've gotten so far of different uh, universities and colleges that are according to their 990 forms or according to news sources are invested in these two funds. And here's a little table that shows some of the colleges and then some of the the companies that those funds bank own. If you go to the company's websites, they often have on their sites like, oh yeah, where where our partner is, natural gas partners, um, and what that means is they're being funded by them. So to just to get to the end of it, right? So mapping it all out. Once you have all this information, you're compiling it, you can really start to create you know, these visual and, and strategic maps that show the extent to which, um, you know, just starting at, nat at, 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 at the uh, natural gas partners firm, you know, these are just two of the funds that are, that, are, that are still like live right now. And these are companies that they're invested in. There's many more companies that are invested in, but we're just using three here. These are, you know, uh, colleges that are invested in these firms, as far as we know from their most recent filings. And then um, here's the whole another wing of the, the, the power structure around this, that it's connected to Rubenstein and Carlisle and all of their connections and antics. Um, and you see also that in, in some ways, like universities over here are connected to universities over here through this power network, right? So I put some questions, you know, here on the side with like a power map like this, for instance, like what are examples of like, you know, things that you could strategize around or points of leverage or, you know, alliances you could make or, um, you know, maybe try to find out what are these companies up to? Are there groups over there that are suffering or that represent communities that might be suffering in some way from what, the, what they're doing? Um, so, and so on and so on. How can we flesh this out to, to, um, to, uh, to do that? So I will end here with just a few thoughts and takeaways and then we can, we can have some discussion. Um, uh, um, I guess, you know, what maybe, you know, this is recapping a lot of what we said, and I'll leave it here for a second, but, you know, one of the two or three important things to remember are just that sometimes just researching this information and putting, make, making it public and getting it out there and letting them know that you know it is important because they really don't want people to know this stuff. It's hidden really well for a reason. Um, and just by starting to bring this stuff out in these relationships can sometimes make uh, create friction and create pressure that can work to the advantage of divestment campaigns. Um, 
also just, I don't want to get everybody's hopes up too much. Like there's going to be some instances where you're not going to be able to find a lot. There'll be some instances where you're able, you are able to find a lot. So um, I think it's, you know, useful to, to, um, you know, think about this as a wider, wider movement as well as like individual campus movements, like this sort of power mapping work to find things. Um, uh, finally, I'll, you know, I think it's also it's important to remember that a lot of these public filings, we're always looking at the most recent things we can find, and there might be a year, sometimes even two years of a lag. So, you know, it's always important to, to, to say that, like, you know, according to the most recent filings, we know you're invested in X, Y, Z, um, you know, and is a way to get them to be transparent. They might say, we're not invested in this anymore. That was two years ago. But then you say, okay, well, what are you invested in, right? Um, but anyway, these are all things to think about. And um, I will... We'll open it up for discussion. I'll also just say this is one piece of the puzzle, of course. The other big piece is, you know, re, um, reinvestment, um, just transition. And Sasha from um, the Climate Action Movement put together some really fantastic resources around all of these questions that are also here at the end of, of, of the PowerPoint. Um, and so these will be here for people's availability. And Sasha is also going to come in and, and do and sort of help lead discussion and field questions um, in particular because you know, she, she and Climate Action know much more about that other end of, of this question than I do. So um, it's 4.52, so sorry to take a few minutes extra, but um, maybe um, Manira can, can and, 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 and a few of us can feed, uh, facilitate and field some, field some questions now. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, um, Derek and Noah and Sasha for helping organize this awesome webinar. Um, we have some time for questions. Um, and what we can do is just take stack in the chat uh, box. So if you have a question, go ahead and um, let me know in the chat and I can unmute you and you can ask that question. You can ask the question yourself or I can also read out the question for you. Great. So we have one person on stack already. Um, Mark, I'm going to go ahead and take you off mute. Um, thank you. I, a great presentation. Learned a lot. I wonder if someone could speak to best practices of how to form a research pod. Uh, I saw that note on that last slide. Thank you. Um. I mean, we could, yeah, we could take a stab at it. You know, some maybe some of the little cis people. Um, you know, we have some experience. We started this project called Map the Power um, about two years ago that was sort of aimed at making, making all of this sort of, you know, these how-to resources around power research more, more available so people could form like local research pods. And, um, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, Manira, do you want to talk, talk a little bit about the Philly Research Crew? Because I feel like that's the most, like, the most impressive research pod that that is. Sure, yeah. So um, in Philly, we started a group called Philly Power Research um, a few years back and um, with the aim of um, sort of giving people, um, you know, um, kind of building up people's research skills and, um, you know, uh, encouraging people to do kind of local power structure research where they are. Um, and kind of building up muscles around um, doing research for the movement. And so um, that's, we have, a, we have a website where you can kind of see some of the collaborative research work that we've done together over the years. It ranges um, in issues and sort of uh, areas of focus and, um, you know, and, and slowly over time and, you know, over many years of meeting pretty regularly, we've been able to um, kind of uh, train people up in in doing research people who had never you know previously done kind of power research um, uh, came into the group and 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 we kind of built up those skills together um, and so uh, you know kind of local uh, research pods are something that I think um, have have uh, a kind of history and um, a kind of long history and I'm interested in hearing if like Sasha or Noah if, if you all can maybe talk a little bit about your experience in doing this research with others where you are. Sure, yeah. Um, Sasha, feel free to jump in if, if you want. Um, the, um, we, <laughs> so 
we've mostly done it sort of as individuals. We're like in CAM, we kind of have a, a, a process of like, you know, sort of, well, it sort of changes depending on how people are feeling, how the meeting structure looks. But often, you know, people who are more interested in the nitty gritty, digging through spreadsheets, researching role, which is more the type of thing that I get into and go down rabbit holes. Like I enjoy that. A lot of people don't. Um, those people kind of volunteer to take things on and, you know, having two or three people coordinate and like shared Google Sheets or something like that to take sort of areas of uh, research. I think there's a couple other people from CAM on here now who have done, like Annabelle, um, who has done a lot of, of that as well um, in terms of digging in, like taking sets of years of, um, you know, minutes and just going and just putting in the names of all of the all of the investment things and then googling each of them and just putting a little note like looks like fossil fuels oh this looks like real estate oh this looks like this and making note of any sort of potential flags or ooh this looks like we should look into this further and you know it's kind of doing an iterative thing like that where then others can sort of look at and sort of take on chunks so it's kind of a fluid not very well structured because everybody's doing it in their in their spare time but then also through doing that, we managed to connect with some folks who then found the same, a similar database that a previous divestment group at Michigan had done that then you know, grew it by, by a whole bunch. So sharing that information across groups is something that is only becoming more clear that it's important to do because a lot of people are doing this in isolation. And so publicizing and making sure that others are aware um, is something I think we're realizing is becoming more and more important as people are have common interests, especially through this private equity, when you have these diversified private equity funds that are actually investing in a bunch of terrible shit. And, you know, like we're actually trying to inve investigate the same people just doing different terrible shit because of our own specific sort of focus right now. Yeah, I could add on to that just a, a little bit, I guess, um, which is to say, um, yeah, as Noah said in the beginning, it was pretty ad hoc for us, where people who were just particularly interested in this, but I think. Um, part of what helped us sort of grow the, I, I suppose the term we're using is research pod that we were using was actually doing sort of a series of like internal teach-ins so that we were not just siloing those people who had independently kind of developed that, that interest, but making sure that information was being spread within our group first too, before like going into this kind of public media splash that Noah's talking about, uh, just to make sure that we all had some baseline information to discuss these things and actually kind of spark that interest in people in our organizing spheres to participate in that action. Um, and then I also wanted to just say that as far as Noah is talking about with um, sharing information, one of the things in the kind of resources slides that you'll see later is a link to uh, the Climate College Coalition. And so for people who are interested particularly in seeing how other universities or other groups have been doing this, sharing resources, that's uh, a really great place to start if you're not already connected to that group. Um, you can get kind of templates and advice from fellow organizers there. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So if there's anyone else um, who's on that wants to ask a question, um, Go ahead and let me know in the chat and I can take you off mute. Um, if not, maybe we can, um, Sasha, if you want to just mention any of the other resources at the end. Um, or yeah, talk through any any of the the other resources that you shared, that would be that could be a good a good way for us to end. Uh, yeah, I can do that if someone doesn't mind sort of flipping through the slides a little good. Yeah, I mean, here um, we go. Yeah, so I mean, these ones, it'll depend, the utility of them will depend sort of on where you are in your campaign. Um, but these are a couple, oh, I don't know where that red circle came from. <laughs> um, great guy, <laughs> we're just sort of starting up um, a divestment ca campaign. So Fossil Free Toolkit, um, it kind of says what it is. It's a campus guide to fossil fuel divestment. There's a lot of great resources in there about just beginning to figure out basic information about like what are lists of fossil fuel companies? How do you define what a fossil fuel company is? Um, as well as just some kind of basic base building things like that. Um, there are also a number of trainings that are offered by that same group, which is 350. Um, another group that's kind of highlighted here is Divested. And I think we maybe have 
a couple people from there on here as well. I think Divest Ed is really fantastic. Um, and if you're starting out a divestment campaign, they are people that I would really encourage you to kind of get involved with or in touch with um, and also just visit their website even if you can't get in touch and they have a whole list um, of resources for everything from like kind of how to message around divestment um, what it is why we're interested in it um, FAQs but then also going a little bit more deeply into some of that intersectionality of uh, divestment why we care about it um, how it fits into anti-oppression movement work um, things like that. So just kind of a great place to to start um, is with them. And yeah, I guess if you move to the next slide. Uh, researching the finances, these I just kind of collated from what Derek talked through. I don't have a ton of to say more about them. They're just uh, kind of in one place, all the sort of resources that Derek went over in the presentation. And the only thing that I added here was the report from Harvard's prison divestment campaign. Um, and that's different in the sense that we talked primarily about private equity in this um, presentation, in this webinar. And this gives a fairly in-depth description of how this group kind of went about um, identifying public holdings. And so if you're interested in that angle, that's a good place to start also to see sort of a step-by-step -step, um, process for how they went about that. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, and then finally, this is what Derek was mentioning earlier, which is just the reinvestment angle. So historically, divestment campaigns have focused a lot on um, just kind of getting out of a particular industry. Um, and this push is to say that we should be focusing not just on tearing down the things that we don't like, but building up the world that we do want, and that that should go a step further than just putting money into um, SRIs, so socially responsible indices of investments, which um, frequently are still, you know, just kind of part of traditional economic models um, in the market. And so community reinvestment focuses a lot more on like localizing what you're reinvesting in into like community wealth funds. Um, there are a number of different kind of criteria about what those funds might look like and how they kind of build up a regenerative economy. And so there are a number of different groups kind of working on building that up. Again, there's just kind of a basic toolkit from Divested that also lists a lot um, of other resources and things you might look into. Um, there's the Reinvest in Our Power campaign from the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, so they're actually launching a campaign specifically to tie campus divestment movements to the reinvestment. Um, movement. And then the Boston, Boston and Jima project is just an example of a community wealth fund. There are a bunch of these, um, but that's a particularly sort of well-formed example. And then the final thing, and I'll be quiet, <laughs> um, is just some of these collaborative groups um, that you can get in touch with um, if you're interested in trainings um, or just, again, templates, example letters, op-eds, anything like that. Um, is again divested, um, the College Climate Coalition, and then the PowerShift Network are all really excellent groups to get in touch with and share resources with. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> awesome. That was a really great um, kind of um, ending to this uh, webinar. I hope that we can all stay in touch. Um, please reach out to us at Little Sis um, and at um, the Climate Coalition and um, keep an eye out for an email that has um, all of these resources as well as the slides and um, you know please share those widely um, and we look forward to, to staying in touch with you all thanks so much for joining thank you thanks everyone <laughs>